consumers are going to benefit from a better understanding of the economics of pork production. And always keep in mind that the views expressed by the guest speakers are theirs and not those of the National Pork Board, which does not advocate or endorse any particular production or marketing direction. So the next slide will have a place for you folks to enter your questions that we'll answer at the end. And so we're on Zoom today. And so you will see on your screen, there's a Q&A uh, button near the bottom center of your screen. And if you've got questions as we go through the report um, and hear from our economists, make sure that you type them in the chat, excuse me, the Q&A feature. And then Brian Humphreys, our Vice President of Producer and State Engagement, will help moderate that Q&A session later on today. So again, Q&A at the bottom, we encourage you to uh, type in your questions. So the next slide, I'd like to introduce our speakers here today. Of course, uh, myself kicking this off, we'll have Dr. Steve Meyer, who's the economist at Partners for Production Agriculture. We'll go to Bob Brown, then Alton Kahlo, and then uh, Dale Durkholz will uh, bat cleanup. And then after that, we'll uh, have everybody turn on their cameras and turn on their mics, and Brian will host the Q&A session with all of the attendees. So with that, uh, Dr. Meyer, uh, we'll go to the next slide and turn it over to you for the numbers. Thanks. Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege again to be with you today, and uh, we have a great lineup of analysts uh, ready to talk to you about what uh, is in today's Hogs and Pigs report. Before we let them tell you the what it means, I'm going to tell you the what it is, and uh, so let's talk about the numbers. Uh, December 1, inventory, all hogs and pigs, 77.502 million head. That number is down nine-tenths of 1%, almost precisely on what the average anal of, of analyst pre-report estimates as published by Erner Berry was. At, they were at 99%. Kept for breeding, 6.276 million head, 3% larger, uh, smaller than a year ago. The analysts expected that number to only be down 1.8%, so a little bit of difference there. Kept for marketing, 71.226 million head, down seven tenths of 1%, quite close to the analyst pre report estimates of down 1%. Uh, on the weight categories, under 50 pounds, 21.739 million head, down 1.4%, a little bit bigger than what analysts expected. 50 to 119 pounds, 20.260 million head, down 1.8%, uh, just right on the analyst number. 120 to 179, 15.246 million head, uh, virtually even with one year ago. An analyst said it'd be marginally higher, but uh, very little difference there. And finally, the 180 and over number at 13.98 million head, up 1.2% from a year ago. Analysts had thought that number would be up close to 2%, so a bit of a, a difference on that number as well. On the farrowing, September to November of uh, sows farrowed 3.164 million head, down 1% from a year ago, significantly larger than what analysts had expected. They thought that number would be down uh, almost 4%. These Feb intentions, the 3.118 million litters, up 1.6%. Uh, analysts had expected that number to be down 1.7, so another uh, significant discrepancy there. On March, May intentions, 3.123 million head, down eight tenths of 1%, pretty close to the analyst expectation of down 1.4. The Sapno pig crop, 34.973 million head, down only 1.4% from a year ago. An analyst had expected that number to be down 3.4%, so a pretty big difference there. And finally, Sapno pig save per litter at 11.05, down slightly from a year ago basically flat with the previous quarter and up only marginally from the first half of this year when the average was 11. So that number was a bit down a bit from last year. Analysts had expected it to, to grow a bit. Uh, there was probably some kind of selective uh, weaning going on on some pigs even during the Setnov quarter. Uh, so Bill, that's the numbers. We'll pass it along, I believe, to Bob Brown, who's gonna be talking to you about, uh, I think, mainly some revisions. Bob? Okay, can you hear me? We can, hey. Bob. Would you also turn on your camera as well? Okay. Great. Okay. Yay. <clears throat> 
Well, the USDA uh, did it again for us. Uh, they reached way far back. I mean, the, the biggest, uh, they had a revision even to last December's uh, total inventory, 820,000 head, 1%. The biggest revision came in the uh, June 1st inventory. They, did, they, re they reduced that number by 2 million head, which is 2.5%. Uh, uh, part of that was a million head revision in the DSFED pig crop and a, a about a 300,000 head revision in the March May pick crop down 2.8% uh, and 0.8%. Uh, I, I guess to kind of epitomize the kind of turmoil they were looking at also, uh, the 180 and up uh, market, market hogs on the September report, uh, they revised those down 1.1 million head, I think it was. It was uh, 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 14, about 14.2 million in, when it was reported in September. And this report had it at about 13.1 million. So it's like, whew, you know, uh, one of those reports that you, uh, they have a hard job and, and uh, it's, it's just difficult in the turmoil that we were seeing and was going on. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the biggest surprise for me was an upward revision in the June-August pig crop. It looked like they raised that pig crop almost a million head, uh, which is like, okay, those hogs will be, let's see, June-August, those hogs will be slaughtered starting now. So we ought to start seeing them now, uh, 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 December, February time period. Um, there were uh, no revisions, I don't believe, in the breeding herd. And uh, Alton, I think you're gonna talk about the breeding herds. So. Yes, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, so I guess on the, the breeding herd number was probably one of the more surprising numbers in the report, if you were to look at what the analysts were expecting coming into this. Uh, However, you have to kind of look at how these analysts are, are coming up with some of these estimates. Uh, you know, you, you, you look at what the breeding herd was in the previous quarter. Uh, there's some sort of a, an idea as to usually how those numbers change from quarter to quarter and you come up with that estimate. However, uh, what this uh, report from USDA shows is that producers appear to retain fewer gilds in the last quarter, and then you add on top of that the higher rate of slaughter. Uh, according to my estimates, September, November, uh, sow and boar slaughter was about 5.3% lower, I'm sorry, higher than it was the previous year. Uh, so you're, you're starting the, the quarter, you know, it, with about 6.33 million hogs, you know, then you're, you're subtracting, you know, a, a larger number of, of uh, of sows and, and boars from that. Uh, and according to, again, according to my calculations, I think that guilt retention during the quarter was about 6% lower than it was during the same quarter a year ago. And so by the end of the September, November quarter, so on December 1, the breeding herd was 6.276 6 million head, 3% lower than it was a year ago. It is the smallest breeding herd that we've had since early 2018. Again, to put the number in perspective, the, the, year, the quarter to quarter decline, so from September to December was 0.9%. The last time that we saw that type of a decline in the breeding herd was in December of 2014. To me, it underscores some of the decisions and some of the issues that the farmers are currently having to deal with uh, and the producers are having to deal with. Uncertainty in the domestic market as far as demand is concerned. You know, when is it gonna be, demand gonna start to kick in? Obviously tied to the pandemic. You know, what's gonna happen with export demand? Is that gonna hold together the way it held together during much of 2020 and in part of, in part of 2019? And then you have the uncertainty regarding you know, feed costs. And I think Dale is gonna talk a little bit more to that. So to me, the, the decline in the breeding herd is one of the more important numbers in this report. And it speaks to the uh, uncertainty as far as overall supplies 
for the summer and the fall of 2021. And I'll pass the baton to the Dale, Dale I guess. Well, thank you, Alton. Uh, uh, at this particular moment, anyway, you know, the, the, the mismatch Alton was talking about there as far as the December 1 breeding herd number really gets reinforced when you look at a breeding herd that's going to be as low as he said, down about 3% from last year. And yet we're stepping, stepping back and we're seeing the USDA picking up apparently that uh, farrowing intentions here for the December, February quarter are going to be up 1.6% from what they were a year ago. They drop off a little bit in the March, May, but you know, when you have a breeding herd, it's down 3% and yet you're asking, uh, you're asking uh, farrowing numbers to, to jump that kind of level. You know, you've got some kind of obvious mismatch going on here. Further reinforced, Alton was talking a little bit about there too, uh, the level of sow slaughter that we have had, sow and boar, and also looking at uh, the level of apparent guilt retention we had had through the last quarter. So it immediately draws into question, you know, with that size of breeding herd. Breeding herd, and if that is a solid a number, is what, you know, the industry or, or we in the analytical community typically, typically use, you know, what's going to happen with this um, uh, December, February farrowing number. And certainly, you know, that has implications once we look out into the, to the late summer and on into the fall, winter, quarters as far as the number of pigs coming out. One thing that, that adds into this mix that, that I'd like to add here that, that all of us in the analytical community are having is the difficulties we had in the slaughter industry last year and, and the shifts in terms of when hogs were slaughtered, how many hogs were potentially maybe euthanized, which we really don't know, creates a real nightmare from an analyst to, to utilize last, near, last year's numbers as a basis. And it's probably gonna to continue to add some volatility here in everyone's ideas and expectations as we go forward. Certainly in, in my ideas and attitudes about what we could see, you know, it leaves a lot of uncertainty. The other thing going along with this dilemma between the size of the breeding herd and looking at that farrowing intention number is what's happened to the feeding ingredient side of the situation. And I see and hear this somewhat on a daily basis as I talk to those in the, in the farm community itself that sold corn, soybeans, you know, too early, whether it was last summer or early last fall and seeing where prices are today. On the flip side of this, when you look at the the feed ingredient side of not only the hogs, but all, also any of the, the meat producing industries we have here in this country, you know, how well are those people covered and the level of coverage that they've, they have in place and going forward certainly is going to have some implications as we step back and we start to look what kind of farrowings are they going to pursue as we move forward into 2021 itself. So again, you know, it's a situation to where we're seeing some numbers that don't potentially agree in the hog and pig report itself, but also what's going to happen with this higher feed ingredient structure that we're dealing with here, $4 corn, meal over 400, in terms of what producers in the industry are going to be doing as far as actual farrowings here as we move deeper into winter and certainly even on into spring and summer and all the, the interest the, the whole grain industry is getting about what China's gonna do and what the, the South American crops are gonna be like here as we move through the next uh, three to six months. So, you know, there's a whole lot of uncertainty that, that everything has been injected with here and something that we're all going to be dealing with as, as we move into 2021. Dale and all of our speakers uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, for folks on the call, uh, down at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A section. If you'd like to go ahead and type in your questions there, uh, all of our speakers will be turned on their cameras and we'll be available to, to answer your questions uh, as they pop up here. First one to start off, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob uh, quick if I could, but uh, I had a question here. Uh, what portion of the revisions in prior estimates were due to other disappearance and not in the quote unquote beginning inventories that are implied by the USDA report. 
For example, do we believe more changes were due to disappearance of market hogs outside of harvesting rather than to lower starting levels in the beginning? Well, when you do the balance sheets and um, take into consideration slaughter and the pig crops that they that the USDA reported, they they remain fairly consistent uh, from the previous reports. Uh, it still looks like that in the April June or I should say the <clears throat> March May quarter, there was there was about a million eight hundred thousand hogs that were that disappeared, and that did not change. So uh, they again a, a, dip, a difficult situation for them to try to figure out what the numbers actually were, but. It appears like that they stayed with their disappearance numbers that they had before. Dale or Alton or Steve, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, just to follow up on on you know what uh, what we're talking about. I mean, it, the, the the reality is that the really good number or the only good number the USDA has, as far as the supplies are concerned has to do, you know, is, is the slaughter numbers. You know, we only see the animals when they come to market. And then USDA has to go back and adjust because of all the disruptions due to COVID, uh, you know, there's some, some disappearance, things of that nature. It becomes, it's a really tough job for the USDA to then go back and use their regular methods to make some of these adjustments. It's also hard for us to know, you know, what proportion, you know, was due to disappearance, what, you know, what, what it was because of, you know, the, the mismatch of, of, or and miscounting of previous years. And so, you know, what Bob just said is that, you know, you, you look at what those implied disappearance numbers are and see if they made any adjustments there. And it didn't seem like they did. You know, I come up, I do the same thing that Bob does, run a balance sheet. And that one, that kind of allows you that you know, to see how the numbers kind of shift from one year to, to the next. And I, I come up with a 1.75 uh, you know, million uh, head difference for that March, May uh, quarter. So again, it, it's, it's hard to say, but as far as the USDA is concerned, the, to them, the really, the real number is the slaughter number. And this year, that methodology has gotten, methodology has gotten a little bit screwed up because of all that's been going on. Along those same lines, Bob and Alton, and, and I think everybody mentioned uh, revisions just a little bit here. Um, is, is the number of revisions here uncommon uh, or is that something that uh, has, it happens as we go through these reports and additional data is found? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just kind of oh, go ahead, Bob. And I'll yeah, in my in my experience, it, the reaching back to last December to start there, I mean, to, to, uh, that that was a little bit unusual. I thought the the uh, that was a full one percent revision. That's that's a little bit high. I mean, I think that was a little bit. And then to, but again, you got to remember, you got to remember the environment starting in March, uh, you know, was fraught to start with. Okay, so. I'm cutting them a little slack. Oh, did you have something else? Yeah, and I, no, I, I, and I don't have. I mean, we, we, we haven't had enough time to go back and do a comparison of the revisions over time to see how this stacks up with previous. They always make revisions a little bit here, a little bit there. Numbers never match with what comes to slaughter. I would guess that probably 2014 is probably one of those years where we saw major revisions. And yeah. again, it was a year when this pretty significant shock due to the PED uh, you know, uh, outbreak. And so, but it, it, this is a fairly significant revision that was made to the numbers, but it also fits with what's been going on in the industry for the last you know, nine months and all the, the major dis disruptions that have you know, changed just about everything and the way we do business. You know, to, to back up what, what Alton and, and Bob both said, you know, anytime you have the kind of disruption that you had last spring with with the, the slaughter of hogs or cattle, whatever the case may be, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of uncertainty that's injected into the mix. And, and, you know, as Alton mentioned, you know, the final, the final arbiter of everything is the number of hogs slaughtered. And that's all we've really got to work with and all we really have to go on. So, 
as we go through time, we're able to look at those numbers and we're able to look at the, the past hog and pig reports and kind of deduce, you know, maybe where, where we were, what happened. But because we don't count other disappearance, AKA hogs that are euthanized or any other such as sundry items, because, you know, that number isn't counted, you know, it, it's always difficult to say, you know, what actually was the actual situation. And, it, and whenever you have unusual circumstances, this is going to be the reality and that there's going to be some uncertainty that's injected until we start moving away and we can adequately look back and see what really went on. Appreciate that. Uh, one of the other questions, uh, and we've got a couple coming in through the question and answer session. And for those of you on the call, uh, feel free to jump on. It's the Q&A part down there in the bottom part of your screen and go ahead and send them to us. Um, we've uh, had a, a couple of folks that had sent in messages to us uh, asking about sow slaughter uh, in the, the um, fewer gilts, lower retention, and yet uh, how can farrowing intentions be higher than last year? And uh, Alton, you addressed that a little bit, but wanted to open up for discussion among the rest of the groups to, among the rest of the speakers to have a conversation there. Bob, go, uh, go ahead, Bob, and I'll talk. Uh, okay, that all is, right, I yeah, that, that is a survey question on, if you've ever seen the survey, that's a survey question. And again, uh, it's just uh, the best, uh, the best accumulation of the data that the USDA gathers on that particular question for the next six months. So uh, we forecast for a living and that's what they're doing too. They're basically forecasting. Now, I will say the DSFEB, for instance, the DSFEB intentions, those uh, part of those gilts are already bred. So, mm -hmm. you know, that about half those gilts are already bred. So they should have a pretty good handle on that. And, and so, you know, again, like Alton said earlier, it also brings into question uh, was the breeding herd really down that much? Uh, uh, we would say again, looking at the sow slaughter that it probably was. So, you know, I don't, it's just one of those things that we have dealt with ever since the beginning of hogs and pigs reports, <laughs> trying to decipher if the intentions are, uh, do they help us or actually hurt us? You know, we're not sure in the market if it actually makes the market more efficient or not, so. But we all, you know, we, again, it's it's a survey question. Uh, producers hopefully answered it in, in good faith and, you know, I'll take their word for it. So. Yeah, so just, just to kind of follow up on what Bob is saying. So what the USDA does is they, they look at what the slaughter numbers were in a given quarter, and then they go backwards and they adjust farrowing numbers for the period that corresponds to that slaughter period, right? And so when they went back and revised the December, February farrowings, what it did was now you're, comp you're, you're doing is what you're doing is you're, you're comparing what these farrowing intentions are now to this adjusted number from four quarters ago. And that number for December, February was especially low. Now, why was it especially low? We don't know. We just know that the numbers that came through were low. So now we're just gonna go back and revise those numbers at that period in time. When I look at the ratio of farrowings to the breeding herd on December 1, 2019, usually you'd probably expect the ratio to be somewhere around 49 and a half, 50, 50 and a half, something like that. It kind of varies from one year to the next. Last year, the ratio was 47, Point four, uh, I have it in front of me, 47.4 percent. The last time we saw that sort of a ratio, you have to go back again to December of 2013 to see that sort of a ratio. So why was did we have this sort of a shock in the system? Back then, PDV was an issue. This time around, maybe it was COVID, maybe it was other issues that somehow got attributed to the farrowing numbers because that's the number that USDA goes back and changes. And so you are comparing to a number that was especially low four quarters ago. And I think that is the reason. When I, I don't think the fairly intention number the USDA published in this report is unusual because if you were to look at the ratio of those fairly intentions to the breeding herd on December 1, it's only 49.7. It is within the range that we normally see for this time of year. So I think it's just the year over year comparison that's throwing you off 
it is not that this number that's published today, it's unusual in any way. So that's what I would suggest. Yeah, you make a good point there, Alton. You know, it's we're looking at things today and we're trying to compare them to last year. And it's what I said earlier, you know, it's almost like when you look at the data for 2020 itself, you really need to step back and go, I really need to look at my data in reference to some past year, whether it's 2019, 18, or a whole series of years, and look at it in that regard instead of trying to look at thing this year compared to last year, because last year's data is always going to be an anomaly that we're never going to be able to rectify because of the disruption we had in the slaughter stream and what that meant to changing other disappearance and what that meant to hogs being pushed forward in, in the slaughter pipeline over the period of time. Uh, that slaughter pattern is never going to match up well when we look at farrowing numbers themselves. So we just pretty much need to discount and look at everything compared to two years ago or something earlier to start making sense out of it. Um, Brian, this is Steve Meyer. If I could interject something real quickly here. We made this point several times, but let's remember, Bob, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the yardstick they would have to use to, to adjust uh, to revise these feb farrowings last year would have been June-August slaughter this last summer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that was a little screwy, okay? Yep. And, and probably, so again, it goes back to this thing of, uh, you know, the USDA has a hard job in normal times, and they didn't have a good yardstick for this year. So um, we can beat this dead horse as long as we want to, but I think it underscores the fact that the 2020 data is going to be pretty difficult to use as a base for comparison going forward. Um, and, and they're going to revise it and make it better to use than had we been stuck with the raw data uh, that they started with. So. I appreciate that, Steve. And, and we've got another question here in the panel. And again, for folks on the call, uh, the Q&A button down there at the bottom, feel free to type in your chat. Steve, this question is directed at you, uh, but in the report, it mentions 11.0 uh, wean. Uh, that number is slightly higher than the commercial benchmark data. Uh, do we consider that? Uh, what are our thoughts on that number compared to the benchmark data? Well, um... <laughs> Uh, I would I would always put a little more stock in the benchmark data in most cases. Uh, USDA estimates a pig crop. They estimate, um, you know, a, um, uh, a breeding herd and the pigs per litter is the difference, is the, is the uh, quotient of those two things. And they will tend to change, they use, they use the farrowings to change how the size of the pig crop. They won't ever back off of that 1105 that's there right now. So... Um, I think import, it's important to just put it in context of the history. Uh, and, and the point that we made earlier was that the 1105 is no larger hardly than the first half of the year. And this is a number that has grown pretty steadily at one and a half percent over the last four or five years. And so you've got a flattening of that litter size. Um, I, I think also that uh, the, the, the commercial uh, benchmark systems are, are weighted pretty heavily to the large producers. And, and I believe that the large producers may have been more active in trying to uh, control the number of pigs that went out of their, far their farrowing units into nurseries and limit those uh, in some fashion so that they stayed within what they can get into their packing plants and that kind of thing as we go forward. So um, I guess I'm not too worried about it that it's different. Uh, I think it's important to keep it in the context of time. And I would open that up for the other three of you to comment on as well. Good. All right. Uh, next question here, uh, and, and one I had not considered before, so I think it's a great question, but does USDA give any info on the number of producer participation or the percent of producer participation in the survey? Uh, and if they do, has that number gone up and down uh, in the past? And I don't have any idea on that one. Steve, you want to talk about their stratified sampling and their area frame sampling? Anybody, anybody want to dive into that? No, I think you can do that, Bob. Go right in. You actually know the one. You know the words. I don't think I know well, the that, words. Go ahead. That's the only. That's the only problem. I, that, okay. So the way the USDA they they 
they stratify the, the uh, producers by size. Mm -hmm. And then, then they sample them. Uh, the, they try to hit all the big ones. And, but again, they don't, they don't offer us that data. Okay, so just to put, they try to hit all the big ones. And then again, a sampling of, as they go down the stratification, the size, they try to, they, they sample the rest of them, make inferences for the total. Uh, then, then they also, I think once a year, the December report, actually, I think they do an area frame where they actually look at the number of animals in a particular geographical area. So, and, and then they try to match up all that data over time. I mean, I'm very, it's my, I'm simplifying it quite a bit, but again, they do not offer us any data on uh, what percent of, of returns of, of the sampling. Actually, they do, Bob. Oh, okay. uh, on, at the top of page 14, the last page of the report, under survey procedures, they sent out roughly 6,000, uh, a sam random sample of roughly 6,000 U.S. producers was surveyed. Um, it ensured that all hogs and pig producers, regardless of size, had a chance to be included. Large operations were sampled more heavily than small ones. During the first half of December of 2020, data was received from 4,500 of those, a 70.7% uh, uh, response rate. The data uh, is received by electronic mail, telephone, and uh, when regardless of when they respond, they were asked to report inventories as of December 1st. So for this survey, it was 70.7%. And uh, many of you have heard me on my soapbox preaching, you know, if you don't respond to the survey, it can't be very accurate. So uh, they can't get do any better than what the data is they get. And uh, historically, I don't know what that number is. I don't. I don't either. I, I, I don't that, know. Yeah. But I, I think it is. I think it is mentioned at the top of that last page every yep. quarter. So yep. you can always look at that. Yeah, it is. It is a follow up to go along with that. They also uh, at the back end of their reports. I know on the grain reports, and even as I remember looking at the hogs and pigs and the cattle. They also have uh, uh, the statistical data that talks about the accuracy of, uh, of the reports themselves over history of time, too. But they're very upfront about their procedures and, and their results uh, that, that they get, you know, in their survey process itself. They don't try to hide any of that. Excellent. Bottom line for everybody on the call, make sure you're participating in the USDA uh, surveys and NAS reports so that we can we can help out there. Another question that just came in, uh, uh, and it relates to the sow slaughter numbers again, but uh, how heavily are the numbers in this report uh, and other reports impacted by Canadian sows coming in to, to U.S. slaughter or in these numbers? Uh, and any idea of the impact of Canadian sows on, on this report? Uh, not, it, it, it is not a significant impact. I mean, if you were to look at, and I, I, I have the, the numbers in front of me, but if you were to look at the sow slaughter for for the quarter, quarter, and we don't have the final numbers. We don't have the numbers for November yet, so I had to make an estimate. But my estimate is that imports of sows and boars from uh, Canada during that September-November time period were about 125,000 head. Uh, during that si same period for September-November of a year ago, were 28.5, right? So the the net is is negligible when you when you're looking at a breeding herd that's. Uh, you know, over 6 million, 6 million head. And over time, that doesn't change more than 20,000 head in a quarter, no. plus exactly. or minus. So yep. it, it doesn't, doesn't swing the number. If they all went away at one time, yeah, it would be, it would be, it'd be a big deal for, you know, that week or that two weeks, because we slaughter 65, 70,000 sows a week in the U.S. And so, you know, we're looking at, like Alton said, 125,000 in a quarter. Again, so it's a, it's a pretty small number, relatively speaking. Okay. A couple of questions have come across uh, my, my phone here from folks on the call, uh, but curious as to, I know some of you have had a chance to dive in a little bit deeper into the data on a state-by-state -state level, but curious on a state-by-state -state level if there's any indication of backups of pigs that we've discussed uh, or what it means. And one of the questions on the screen here was specifically dis discussing uh, the pigs under 50 pounds in Iowa. Uh, versus December 2020 versus December 2019. Uh, so didn't know, uh, Bob, I know you had looked at that a little bit. Didn't know if you wanted to kick off that discussion. Well, I haven't looked at the weight breakdowns by state, 
uh, I just look at the totals by state. And uh, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that there's anything, again, uh, if you, if you, you got to make a decision at some point for yourself, are we, are we backlogged or not? Okay. And so this is the way I'll just tell you, this is the way I made it. Okay. This is not answering the question he asked. So that's the danger with analysts. They'll tell you what you know, what they know. They won't necessarily answer your question. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what I do know. Okay. We watch these weights that, that to me, this is critical. This was critical this year. We watch these weights go up and up and up and peak in May and then start coming down and down and down. Okay, and it appeared to us, and I say us, it appeared to me that there was significant uh, participation in maintenance, maintenance rations during the summer. Uh, weights dropped much faster than normal. Again, they were way high, so they were record high to start with. And about Labor Day, weights, met the five-year average, met a year ago, okay? So they zeroed out from, from the prior year and then turned on a dime and went sharply higher, okay? Went up very quickly. Again, if you give a hungry hog, you know, more food, he's gonna gain weight, right? So I figured all the hogs were pretty hungry if they were on maintenance rations for a while. But what, so in my mind, by the end, by the first week in September or by the first half of September, Producers had decided we have cleared the backlog and we can start feeding our hogs again. Again, that, that's just my conjecture. Uh, that's a, just an observational analysis based on what I've seen the weights happen. So I'm going to say from my analysis, we, are, we do not have hogs backed up. Uh, regardless of what his question was, I, that, that was the answer to that question. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just follow up on, on what you just said, Bob. I mean, I think part of it also has to do with where where some of these hogs are are located and who owns them. Uh, and I think that's the issue sometimes with anecdotal evidence, right? So, uh, you know, you can talk to a producer in an area and everything where he is and all the friends that he talks to, you know, they're all caught up and they see no issues. In some cases, they may see shortages. But then you can look at a different part of the market and then you can see an indication where there may be some backups. Uh, my argument all along has been that if there were some backups, they were probably more so on the packer side than they were on the producer side. And one of the things that you look at is if you look at a breakdown of weights by who owns those hogs, weights on packer owned hogs have been incredibly high through the fall. Part of it is because they can manage better than the producers can you know they own the, the 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 packing plant so they can schedule those hogs when they come in but in some cases the weights on those hogs were four and a half five percent higher than a year ago and so uh when i look at this report that just came out uh you look at the breakdown of the various categories by state north carolina 180 pound and over hogs there were 180,000 more hogs than a year ago in that category, 12% more than a year ago. Indiana, 90,000 more hogs than in that, again, in that bucket, 180 pound plus than a year ago. So 9% more than a year ago. The question I think was on the lighter hogs. Well, there's some pretty significant differences in there too. So in North Carolina, you have significantly more hogs than a year ago in that 180 pound and over category. But then when you look at the 50 pound and under, they have 385,000, I'm sorry, 365,000 head less, 11% less than they did a year ago. So it seems like if you've got a few more hogs on the front end that you're kind of dragging them along, well, what you try to do is you slow things down on the back end in order to kind of make everything sort of match over time. And so it seems like that's part of, that's part of what's been going on. And I think it's been going on for, for some time here where you have certain market participants that are able to do so where they're kind of slowing the whole chain down. And the way you slow it down is you, you have more on the back end, on the front end that you're, you're, you're not able to, to work through. And so you start, sort of continue to slowly uh, decrease the numbers on the back end until eventually everything gets sorted out and then you're back in balance again. 
Well, another thing it added into that too, Alton, is we were going through a period of time here up until recent where we were steadily dealing with a seasonal increase in supply of hogs over time too. And so if you were slowing things down on the front, you, you keep backing that up a little bit. But I think two things go along with this that we got to look. Number one, we should be getting near a period of time in here where seasonally our supply, I, I would think, you know, our supply starts to abate a little bit as it does every year seasonally. The other impact coming into this is I question, you know, what kind of or how good is their forward coverage on feed inputs as we look on into 2021? Because dealing with $4 plus corn, dealing with $400 a ton plus meal, you know, this may change some of the, uh, some of the attitudes on how heavy they choose to feed hogs going forward. So yeah, we don't know how they'll manage all of this, but if they make the decision that, okay, we need to start pairing some of these weights back that we're, we're confronting right now, uh, that could actually keep the slaughter pace, in my opinion, a little bit heavy here as we go into the first quarter of 20 to 20, 2021, as we start clearing things and backing my supply of what I'm gonna call market ready hogs down a little bit to get my weights down a little bit. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they manage this situation over the course of the next couple of months. Brian, may I add something right here? Please. Uh, I, I think uh, the first statement made by it all depends on who you're talking about and where is the, the thing to go by here. Uh, it's pretty easy to use the mandatory price reporting data that gives us a weight of producer sold barrels and gilts and then gives us the two categories of packer owned and packer sold barrels and gilts that we can combine to get packer raised picked. Last week, the, the, the relative uh, uh, between those, producers sold barrels and gilts weighed 215 pounds. Packer sold barrels and gilts weighed 222.7 pounds. Parker's weight. That's a difference of 7.7 .7 pounds just based on who owns them. And, and that huge difference has been there all, year, all the entire second half of the year. And... Um, that accounts for 40%, roughly 40% of the hogs in that packer race category. So it's pushing up our production dramatically. And it is, it is disproportionately represented by one packer and by North Carolina pigs, uh, if you think about it, okay? And so um, uh, th th it depends on who you're talking about. Our thought, uh, my thought the last few weeks was has been Anywhere west of North Carolina is pretty well caught up. And I think the market, if you talk to the people in the market, that's what you find out. We're not backed up too much, if at all, in other places. Uh, but if you look at how the, the plants in the Carolinas and Virginia and that part of the world have been able to run, they have, been a, they have had operational problems all along during the summer that backed up a lot of pigs. And it shows up in these packer rays versus producer sold barrels and gilts. And I think that's a pretty good barometer of what's going on there. I, I don't think any of those folks on the, even on the packer side guys want to be have 223 pound carcasses. Uh, mm -hmm. That gives you awfully, awfully big hands and loins and, and cuts to try to merchandise. make another call here for questions. Uh, it appears we've answered all of them in the, the chat so far. So if folks on the call have additional questions, click that little Q&A thing down there at the bottom. Uh, and while we're, uh, while we're waiting on a couple more questions, just uh, one that came in that I thought was interesting, but what are, uh, for, for everybody in the call, we'll start with Steve and, and then Bob and then Alton and end with Dale here. But uh, in the report, as you looked at it, what was the, the biggest surprise? And then what was the biggest uh, takeaway producers should have from this report? So. Uh, and again, for folks on the call, go ahead and ask uh, ask your question in the, the Q&A part down there at the bottom. So, Steve? Hmm. You don't make me go first, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, Give us time to think. Bob, do you know? I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to say here. So if somebody else knows what they're going to say, I'm going to I'm going to uh, pass that. Well, I, I think all of us just assume the pigs for litter is going to go up and up and up and up. Yeah. I think that's that's number one for me <clears throat> is the pigs per litter flat. I mean, August 2019 is the highest month. If you look at the monthly data, which we get to see now, 
uh, uh, August 2020, got pretty close to it, but didn't go through the August 2019. So we've been flat for over a year now in pigs for litter. That's kind of was interesting, interesting to me. And the revisions, I, I think the revisions kind of surprised all of us really. Uh, uh, how, how extensive they were. And I, I guess if you had to tell, uh, talk to us ahead of the report and said, you know, given everything you know, especially those, those uh, market hog weight categories in the September report looked, you know, pretty wild. And so maybe we should have anticipated some, but uh, they, were, they were pretty significant. So, and again, what, what should producers take away from that? Uh, I think it just, you know, again, looking at these weights, I mean, the thing about the weights too is the the Packer owned weights made new highs for the year in November. And, uh, and that, that rare, that rarely happens. A producer has producer owned hogs have actually been, they've been doing, I think a better job of keeping, keeping the weight more towards, uh, current marketings. And I think basically what it says is, uh, producers, it's going to, again, it's going to be, uh, it's going to do you well to keep your hogs, uh, current. Okay, I'll give mine. I, I, I'm not sure I should say this was a surprise to me, but a 97% breeding herd and then farrowings of 99, 101.6 and 99. Um, it always strikes me as odd, but I can't say I'm surprised because USDA doesn't hardly ever match those things up. So I guess um, I'll, find, I'll classify it an oddity, but probably not a surprise. Dale? I think I have to go back with that DSFEB farrowing. It just sticks out at me. And I looked at it when I saw the report and I went, where did that one come from? And I looked at the breeding herd and I looked at the quarter before it and I looked at the quarter after it. And I went, that just doesn't fit. Back to something Bob said, you know, in terms of looking at those packer, packer weights or hogs owned by packer weights. You know, when you look at a large corporate entity like this, you know, compared to some of the producers, they're going to be much more proactive, typically a lot of times managing their feed input costs going forward. Well, we're probably getting pretty well down the pike on how much they had covered. So the real key now is how are they going to manage their weights with heavier hogs with, again, $4 plus corn and $400 protein to start putting through them. So, you know, we could see uh, those, those packer owned weights start to come down pretty fast given the opportunity. And uh, just just to kind of follow up on on this deal, I mean, I, I guess I'll go back to what was my lead on on this, which is the the breeding herd. Uh, it's a it's a big enough decline that you know, I, and I don't know whether it's a it's a surprise or not, given all that's been going on. Actually, I think it would be a surprise. The surprise would have been if the breeding herd had remained unchanged, given all the uh, all the issues that the, the industry is facing at this point. So to me, the takeaway is that we or it, this is an industry that face, always faces a lot of seasonality. You know, there's, there's a seasonality mm -hmm. in demand. There's a season, seasonality in the flow of hogs coming to market. And what this report tells me is that seasonality in 2021 will probably be even further enhanced. I'm looking at weekly slaughter that's going to go from somewhere around 2.6 million plus in Q1 and could drop down fairly sharply by May and early June, somewhere around under 2.3 million head. And so, and then you have the issue that Dale mentioned on, on you know, grain and feed costs overall. You know, can you keep the weights to the levels that we had in 2020 or in 2019? Weather is always a big wild card that we don't know what it is, but it's always an issue come June and July. And so those seasonal factors that we see play out year in and year out in 2021 could be uh, even more of an issue, I guess. And so I think the producers need to be fairly, I mean, they're always aware of that, but that's something that they need to keep a pretty close eye to uh, because of the way that, you know, we've sort of structured the flow of hogs where Things are sort of front loaded, but the you know the the back end doesn't seem to be as as heavy. And the lower breeding herd tells you that probably you're not going to have as many hogs come to market, you know, in in the summer and, and the fall of uh, of 2021. Uh, had another question pop up here, and uh, might be uh, might be about the last one we have time for. But if there's any others, go ahead and pop them in there. Uh, 
given given today's report uh, and the cold storage report from earlier, uh, any uh, any indications on what that means moving forward uh, in, into 2021 for folks? Uh, obviously, lower cold storage and then this report, anything that folks should be paying attention to there? Well, and the cold storage number for total pork was the lowest for a uh, end of November since 1997. So it was uh, pretty extreme. And, and again, I think it just goes to, you know, we, we emptied the freezer significantly in uh, April, May, and June, and, and exports have been pretty good, only uh, uh, actually a little less than I thought for the last half of the year. But we're gonna, we have a pretty good surge going right now, I think, towards the end of the year, thanks to Mexico. Um, uh, so again, what it, what it says is the freezer won't be there hanging over the market. Okay, I mean, uh, one year ago, you know, we had, we were looking at record freezer stocks over 600 million. There were articles written in the Wall Street Journal about how much meat was in the freezer. Now, beef is a little different situation, uh, but poultry has come down sharply. I mean, we shipped 100 million pounds of chicken uh, to China in October, which is a record. So again, that's, that's different. So uh, we're just not, we won't have the freezer stocks hanging over the market. Uh, I think that's probably one thing that uh, we can all agree on. So. Maybe the USDA needs to add another category to the cold storage report and start surveying consumers how much meat they have in the freezer. Right. That'd be great. Yeah, well, seriously, you know, I know uh, back in the summer, even into early fall, you could not buy a deep freeze anywhere in the United States. There were none on the floors. You know, you wonder then how, ma how many freezers were bought and how much meat was packed away in freezers that's still out there today. Yeah, but everybody had to cook at home. So they surely they cooked it all up, right, Dale? Yeah. I did see that USDA graphic today. At home, at home use of meat was like 65 or 67 percent of the total back in uh, April, May. Yeah, I, mine was. I know mine was. I think all of us were. Yeah. All right. Uh, and uh, we'll get ready to wrap up here. Any last closing comments from anybody? And then uh, we've got a slide uh, we want to show everybody here. But any last comments? Brian, I think these guys have some price for you. No, you're going to make us do that. <laughs> no, I think, I think, Brian, something, you know, we haven't talked about exports. I mean, uh, African yeah. swine fever is still an issue in the world, and uh, it's, a, it's still a dang scary thing. And uh, from all I can tell, as soon as U.S. producers heard about it in 18, in the summer of 2018, they put the pedal to the metal. And so they haven't fared too well, and in my estimation, just based on exports to China, uh, necessarily. But uh, 2021 will look quite a bit different. And I think mostly because, again, uh, for my forecast, a big part of the difference is going to be packer margins are going to be quite a bit uh, less than, the, than what we saw, especially in March, April, May, June, July, and August. So I'll go first on price forecasts. Um, mine is a CME equivalent. Uh, I'll do it by quarters. Uh, we're going to look at first quarter at 64, second 81 third quarter 86, fourth quarter 74. So that'd be the index, Bob? That'd be the index, yeah. Should I have done that slower? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Dale. I did mine on a live equivalent. In first quarter, I was 45 to seven. Second quarter, uh, 51 to 55, third quarter, 46 to 48, and fourth quarter at 44 to 49. And one of the big issues, and, and you know, Bob brought it up, and we haven't on this telecast anyway, or podcast, whatever, Zoom call, whatever it's called, uh, we haven't really talked about exports, but I, I was looking at export data and how much it had jumped in 2019, pork exports itself through the first 10 months. We went from like, the 600 million pounds to over uh, up to 1.7, we tripled it. And then I look back at the, the weekly pork export sales that we get on the weekly data, which isn't a, a great accounting, but it's the best we have. And we're back down to normal levels again, as far as 
sales for 2021 are concerned on the books already for pork. And, you know, I'm really looking at this questioning, what kind of export picture are we going to face as we go into 2021? Is China going to keep up this relentless pace of buying or with the, the modest rebound they've had in their hog herd, maybe back off a little bit? And there's another ironic little thing that I, I looked at here this last week. I put it up on LinkedIn and, and also put it on Twitter. I looked at the, the value of the U.S. dollar. It's a trade-weighted dollar index. Interestingly enough, every time we change administrations, the trend in the dollar index tends to turn somewhere along the way. And in this case, it'll be a, a dollar that's I'll call it since Trump's been in office, been sideways to lower that would be back to one being stronger again. And with about 60, 65% of the value of the dollar, trade weighted dollar index tied to the euro, it means that the US, if, if we see the dollar start creeping up in terms of pork in particular, could start losing some advantage of what we've been dealing with out in the world if the dollar starts to strengthen on us. So to me, the export sector is going to be an interesting place in 2021 to kind of keep an eye on. Well, agreed. I mean, that's on, on our end, that's one thing that we're certainly focusing on. And uh, even though, you know, the, all the reports out there are that China is ramping up production, uh, you look at their pricing, it's as high, uh, you know, far higher than it was, uh, you know, when they had their last peak in price in 2016. Their pork prices right now are 60% higher than they were in 2016. So they've got some ways to go in terms of, you uh, uh, ramping up their own production and who knows how things are going to play out. But at least for the next 12 to 18 months, we still see a pretty good export outlook, uh, at least from our uh, shop uh, for, for U.S. pork exports. Uh, there's also a lot of money that's sloshing around. And, you know, mm -hmm. when do we start uh, seeing some sort of an inflation, you know, inflationary pressure? A lot of that is going to be a function of what, you know, when do we see demand start to you know, come back in. You know, a lot of money has been thrown in there because of the pandemic. There are a lot of pent-up demand. Uh, it's anybody's guess as to when things really start to kick in. But usually, when that happens, you could see things kind of ramp up uh, fairly quickly. So, at least in our shop, we see the risk more to the upside. Uh, as far as price forecasts, we go off of the the CME simply because it's a you know it seems like it's it provides you a blend of what's really going on out there using, you know, kind of where, where the cutout and, uh, and the hog prices are. And so we, we see first quarter somewhere around 65, 66. Uh, we see the second quarter uh, between 78 and 80 cents, uh, third quarter at 81, uh, 80 to 81 cents. And the fourth quarter, we've got it at 66 to 68 cents. Uh, just, just one question or one point about the price forecast. I see my my forecasts are up about $16 a hundredweight from a year ago, if you do the average. $11 of that is packer margin forecast down. Mm. Okay, so again, uh, it, it was just, the packer margins were pushed way out of whack and that really affected li uh, live hog prices and lean hog prices. And so that, that will be a, uh, that'll be a major story actually in 2021 in my mind, uh, compared to 2020. So. And, and right. the impact that has on, on all the prices. Maybe they'll find some extra labor to, uh, you know, to kind of. Well, uh, right. All right. In the essence of time, we've, uh, we've, we've hit our allotted time. I want to take a moment to thank each and Excellent. every one of you for joining us here. Uh, appreciate your time today. And just for our folks on the, on the call here, uh, pork checkoff funds were used to host this webinar. The purpose was to facilitate your understanding of publicly available information. We believe the pork industry and ultimately consumers benefit from better understanding the economics of pork production. But the views expressed on this by our guest speakers are theirs and not those of the National Pork Board, which does not advocate or endorse any particular production or marketing direction. I would like to take this moment to just thank everybody for uh, participating uh, and wish everyone a happy holidays on behalf of the, the, the National Pork Board and the Pork Checkoff. Thank you everyone. Have a, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.